Good evening, everyone. I'm Austin Brigden, Administrative Assistant here at the Longview Public Library, and we're very excited to welcome you tonight to the first of our Northwest Voices for 2022. We're very pleased to have with us for National Poetry Month and Earth Day, uh, Kelly Russell Agadon. Uh, <clears throat> Agadon is an acclaimed Washington poet. Her newest book is Dialogues with Rising Tides out from Copper Canyon Press. I wanna urge you all to get a hold of that collection. She is the co-founder of Two Sylvia's Press where she works as an editor and book cover designer. Her other books include Letters from the Emily Dickinson Room, which I just reread today and was astonished anew at, Hourglass Museum, The Daily Poet, Day-by-Day -day Prompts for Your Writing Practice, co-authored with Martha Solano, and Fire on Her Tongue, an anthology of contemporary women's poetry. She lives in a sleepy seaside town in Washington State on traditional lands of the Chimicum, Coast, Salad, Coast Salish, Sklalem, and Squamish people, where she is an avid paddleboarder and hiker. She teaches at Pacific Lutheran University's low residency MFA program, the Rainier Writing Workshop. Kelly is currently part of a project between local land trusts and artists to help raise awareness for the preservation of land, ecosystems, and biodiversity called Writing the Land. In Agadon's verse, you'll find grief and a delight in life, a savoring of language, and countless exquisite moves. Hers is the perfect voice to have in your ear for these trying times. Her poetry so alive, it will help you turn to see this lovely, damaged world anew. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly. Great. Thank you, Austin. And thank you all for showing up. I saw a lot of friends in the chat. And I'm just thrilled to be here for Earth Day. Um, I'm coming to you from Hood Canal, Washington. So I'm one of the Pacific Northwest uh, voices. And I'm doing a little change. I was looking over the poems I was going to read tonight, and I thought, we're celebrating the earth. I am i don't want anyone to leave here depressed, because as much as we're in here with the climate crisis and all that's going on, um, we are making changes for the better. I, I want to read a quote. I want to start out with a quote from Jane Goodall that meant something to me today when I read it, because I think it you can take it a lot of ways. Here's a quote. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. And that was Jane Goodall who said that. And I thought, you know, it works like that for the environment and it works like that for the world and for kindness and um, you know just being a good human out in the world. So I will start with, I'm gonna be reading some eco poems tonight and I will start um, with one because I think this is kind of funny. I'm gonna be reading from Dialogues with Rising Tides um, from Copper Canyon Press, which will be celebrating its first birthday but I took this poem out of the out of the book, and I'm not sure why. I actually think this should be in the book. So maybe from this point on, um, I'll if somebody buys the book, I will just print this out and mail it to you, and you can stick it on like page 44, um, because I think it should be in the book. It's called "Coping with a Dying Parent," and it plays with the idea of Mother Nature and Earth as Mother. Coping with a dying parent. We never replied to our mother when she, when she wrote to say she'd taken up chain smoking. Nor did we respond when she said, I'm falling apart, though precisely, like parts of her were cracking, ice shelf fissures, pieces of her floating away. We ignored her earlier when she was complaining about all that water weight. Well, yeah, we kind of noticed she wasn't looking well, all those hot flashes, but we continued. Beach bonfires of carbon-based materials. We thought the rising tides would allow us to have waterfront homes. 
And when she called out to us in her stormy voice, a hurricane of anger, like kids, we continued to ignore her, even as we saw her ailing, how indifferent we were as we drove our SUVs across her lawn. So I don't know why that's not in the book. I'm gonna read a poem that is in the book. Um, it's one of my favorites because it's a happier poem. Um, and it reminds me that with all of our struggles and everything going on in the world, nature is continuing to do its thing. Um, and you can see the joy in the world and it's springtime and all the baby animals, which to me is very stressful because I worry about all the baby animals. Um, but nature is playing. And this is a song about a song, a poem about play. It's called What I Call Erosion. Today's sea seems tired of stealing acres of sand from the beach. What I call erosion, the waves call, I wish the wind would stop rushing us. I wish we could just take it slow. In the beauty of white caps, I sometimes see sadness. Sometimes how lucky we are to watch the sunrise one more time. There's so much we're carrying these days. An osprey clutches a fish in its talons. A killdeer runs across the dunes, trying to distract us from its nest. Danger, even when it's not, is everywhere. Sometimes I pretend to have a broken wing as I look out the window, but then a cloudscape in a world of buffalo heads, of saltwater roses, and I forget fear. It's 7 a.m. on a Thursday, and an otter is pretending none of my concerns matter. The otter, if laughter were a mammal, dives in and out of the water playful. When the planet says, this is impossible, the otter responds, only if you believe it. So here's the poems I wasn't planning on reading, but I think it's important to read them because they are new and they are um, positive and hopeful and they really deal with our Northwest uh, environment. So I am in a project called Writing the Land to help raise awareness uh, for the preservation of land and ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, and so what that means is I was adopted by a land trust as their poet. So they adopted a poet or I adopted the land. Um, I'm not sure what we did, but we kind of adopted each other. And so now I have this land um, in Chimicum that's near a family farm where I can go and hike and um, write about it. And it really has changed my relationship to the land to actually like feel ownership of it, but we don't own the land. But I think the word is stewardship. It's having this space that we can take care of. And if we look at that in a larger way, that's actually our world. So I'm gonna read these poems. It's my first time reading them. So I hope I don't bumble around. Um, but I did want to share them tonight because it is Earth Day. The first one is called Magic Wanderers, and it's actually Magic Wand with ER, ERS in it. Magic Wanderers. All week we discussed magic, how we heard a gust of traffic, a few farm animals across the road, until we didn't until the moss covered trees, covered our ears with their branches. 
until a tree frog sang its solo. All weak sword ferns forget the sharpness of their name and wave hello in the breeze. Because the sky is tender, it reminds us to walk softly on provided paths while our stresses disappear. Magic. Who would have thought we didn't need someone to say abracadabra or for my next trip trick? <laughs> Watch the leaves change and tumble down. All week we whispered magic. We almost didn't believe our eyes. And this is a poem I was, I imagined um, if they want to use it, it would, I kind of saw it as like an opening when you get to this place. And this place is called Valley View. And you can actually go there and hike there if you're ever in the Chimicum area, area which is near Port Townsend. Um, it's open to the public. And this one's called Gateway to Valley View. After you arrive, thank the blankets of moss, the bedroom of fallen leaves, the smallest creatures who see big leaf maples as rooftops to their home. As you arrive, let the Douglas fir remove any coats, any heavy coats patched with sorrow. Turn off the newscasts repeating in your mind. The forest speaks to you in whispers of branches, in wingspan and feathers and colors of sky. Open the door to the sunlight rain, raining light drops, to the mist that sometimes holds your hand. Before you leave, clean the fog from your fingernails, sweep the wind off the trail. Before you leave, speak to the snowberries and ask their proper name. They whisper as you clean the soil from your fingers, wipe the dew from your eyes. Before you leave, follow the fern pathway back to your life and thank the daybirds for always remembering there are so many songs of joy. Thank you all, I did bumble a little through that one. Okay, and then my final one from the, the Valley View poems um, is called Song of Spring. Song of Spring. In the forest, the voice of God is a tree frog. An evening chorus reminding us it is spring. We believe we are alone here, but we are followed by chickadees, the dirt we carry on our shoes. Because our hearts are shopping carts, we fill them with mossy rocks and messy headed fern. We know the forest soothes. And when a chipmunk rushes past us and scribbles, I find peace in the chaos on a big leaf maple. We know we have found our home. If God is a tree frog, let her find love at a rowdy party, noise canceling lungs. Let's hold hands and walk deep into the forest. All this harmony to breathe and breathe and breathe. So thank you for listening to those. Um, those are probably my newest poems. I've been working on them and we have a, a June 1st deadline to turn them in. And then we record ourselves reading the poems in the forest. So that will be how I spend my June. So I'll read another poem from Dialogues with Rising Tides and um, this poem was, you know, part of it was inspired by um, my kid who, when they were little, we would watch the Animal Channel and they would say, um, 
they would say like, it's just a circle of life, mom, and everything needs to eat. But I was always screaming at the television, turn it off. I can't watch, you know, the cheetah jump on the zebra. And um, I, I found that to be the most stressful channel um, that we had at the time. Um, so there's a little bit of that in here. And it was inspired by anyone who lives in the Northwest now knows we have that fifth season called Smoke um, when the wildfires hit. And I know in 2020, I had that, you know, feeling of just, you know, the anxiety and everything that was happening from the pandemic. And I wasn't being really grateful for what I did have, like, a house and running water and food. And I remember the wildfires came and it was that year when the smoke was so bad and then we couldn't open our windows and couldn't go outside. And I thought, you know, you really just need to appreciate everything. So this is called How to Live in a State of Fire. Sometimes I look through the other side of my binoculars to keep the world at a distance. When the West Coast was on fire, I dreamed of roasting marshmallows while the smoldering outside my window kept me company. Sometimes I trust too much. This is where guardian angels come in. I forget to lock my doors. Maybe I've given a stranger my keys. Maybe the bears have my password. I've never looked up our guardian angels real. I've never looked out, looked up how to roast marshmallows while the world is on fire. Some nights the moon is a light ship floating in a shallow sea. So bright, I dim the porch light. Much of my life, I've argued with moths until I realized, realized moths are the guardian angels who'll be swallowed by sparrows. Everything needs to eat, my daughter says as we watch the animal channel, her hand placed directly over my eyes. That's a tough channel. So I'm gonna read this poem and I, I don't read this poem a lot because I did some interesting uh, punctuation with it. And I don't, I'm gonna put this up. It's really in short, short little, it's called the ocean is overflowing. Um, just short little bits because I, when I wrote it, I wanted the reader to be able to read the small sentence, but also then connect it with the other small sentence so that sentences could um, ex extend and, and kind of um, move into each other. So you weren't sure what was part of the sentence and what wasn't. Um, and, I, and I formatted it like waves on the page. So I, I like it when my, my poems mirror my content. This is called The Ocean is Overflowing. Maybe it's how the waves feel, like tongue. Maybe you'll pamper my taste for tragedy. How disaster is a distance I'll drive to. How I want what's overflowing in my lungs. I want to be salt licked, an artificial mermaid in Birkenstocks and tie dye, unaware what year it is, who is president, who wants to be president. Like the summers I spent on a beach blanket in unemployment lane, as they called it, the place where all of us with too much time and not enough money spent the day. God, how I miss secondhand smoke, not knowing what could kill us, what we shouldn't suck into our lungs. 
And like the ocean, I want to rest here, a past world of the casually uninformed, where I didn't need much, maybe enough money for noodles, maybe a bent book, a little baby oil, because we had no idea what we were supposed to be afraid of. Thank you um, for listening to that. That's one of the ones I don't read often because the punctuation um, bumps me a little bit. Uh, and Unemployment Lane, for any of you satellites, is that one section in Green Lake where all the students without jobs hang out. Uh, that was my home for uh, a couple summers having grown up in Seattle. So I'll read one more from um, Dialogues, another eco poem. Um, sometimes I try, you know, I wrote my thesis in graduate school. It's funny because I now teach at Pacific Lutheran University where I actually went to graduate school. Um, and we had to write a critical paper. And I remember everyone had their topics except me. And I was floundering around and not knowing what I was gonna write about. And Stephen Corey, who at the time was the editor of the Georgia Review, who was teaching there, said to me, well, of course you know what to write about. And I'm like, absolutely not. I have no idea what I'm writing about. He said, humor, you use humor as a backdoor into harder topics. And so I had never known that. I hadn't know, known that about my own work. A lot of the things in our own work we don't know because it's our work. And I guess I didn't have that insight to it. So I realize a lot of times when I do write about um, more difficult topics, I will use humor as that back door to kind of get me in and to get the reader in. Um, so you might hear a little bit of that in here. This poem's called Unsustainable. And I was thinking of that. So my family buys those water bottles that you use to drink your water so you don't have plastic. And we have a whole cabinet of those. And I'm thinking this is unsustainable. This is, we have too many of these. So this is called unsustainable. When you broke my recycle bin, I started calling you fresh kills. I want to keep you in my plastic happy meal heart, but what snaps open stays on earth forever. My center floating down the canal until it's swallowed by a seal. Who cares our plastic drifts as a tag along to a sunset, an autobiography of artificial, a dead whale washed up in the Philippines, 88 pounds of plastic in its gut. Damn the turtles, Customers at McDonald's want their straws. And we could be practical lover, lovers if we remembered to bring our reusable totes into the store. You said the cashier gave me the stink eye for forgetting, but I was lost in my own head thinking about my grandmother in hospice, leaving the store with a casket of even more plastic bags. It hurts to say my convenience is more important than the sea. I write a postcard to earth. I love you, but watch me navigate your landfills in stilettos. Let me kill your buzz. And you know I'm talking about the bees now. My hands in the dirt. If you want to gather honey, don't kick over every hive. I was thinking a lot about just how I try to be a good citizen. And then uh, next thing you know, I've got plastic bags in my hand. Um, and the line about damn the turtles customers at McDonald's want their straw was a headline um, from a UK newspaper where 
McDonald's was going to get rid of their straws and people were upset. So, all right. I found another Valley View poem. So I'm going to read that and then um, I'm going to read two more and we can talk and answer questions. So I think I'll read this one because it has a little humor, but it is a little darker and it comes from uh, the title's called Sunflower, What Have We Got Ourselves Into? Tonight, a neighbor told me how climate change was a hoax as we stood under an orange sky from the smoke of wildfires. And when he coughed because the air quality was not good enough for his lungs, I said, it hasn't rained for years. And when the sparrows started falling from the sky, he said, that happens sometimes, it's cyclical. God bless the confused, I said to the waves reaching into our yards, to the oceans so warm, the icebergs were ice cubes, the barista placed in our lattes saying, this should cool it. And at night when I walk home in a tank top, because what was once a winter is a mild spring, I lean back and watch the bats circle and eat up whatever insects we have too many of. And I think, my God, we've mucked this up so quickly. And I admire the moon that almost winks at me as if it knows how many years we have left. All right, so um, I'm gonna end on two happy poems. Another one from Valley View, you'll hear sword fern again, which is a hard word to say, but that really is the ferns that they have there. Um, it's called Chasing Light at Valley View. It's a very dark area, but the light comes in in the most dazzling way. Chasing Light at Valley View. Listen, the lichen whisper to the human souls who pause as the sword fern sparkle in the sun. The maple tree without leaves is a poet empty of words. Trust her. It's impossible to know if the ferns punctuate the trail or if the trail is a run on sentence of blue jays trying to be correct. How can a poem live in a forest? How can a life be covered in moss? Listen. The spring birds return and they dress in a wingspan of clouds. There's a legend that believes an owl's song can lead a poet straight to the light we are all trying to hold. Sometimes the quiet is the lichen that get lost in the poem, like when we turned left instead of right. But dear one, in this forest, we are never lost. So my last poem, thank you so much for listening um, to all my, my eco poems tonight and for showing up on a Friday night and not going out dancing. Um, this is dedicated to my kid, um, Lainey Agadon and the only thing to know is I'm going to mention some animals and they are some gender bending animals. So when you hear the animal names, that's what's going on. And um, this poem is for them. It's called Love Song Where Nature is Non-Binary and Uses They Them Pronouns. Because there's a man who likes to trample over what's blooming, he thinks nature is a woman mother, something to serve him, tomatoes or a bucket of apples, something to build his parking lot on, something to cut down. But look at the fig tree, sturdy and in cahoots with the mosquitoes to make sweetness. Look at the river where the sky wades in 
the pink petals atop the rock. Daffodils, snowberries, lavender, blackberries create a blossoming flag. Once in the thick of a forest, a friend asked, who said straight was more natural? It seems more natural is to curve, overflow, expand. Spotted hyenas, chimera butterflies, banana slug, clownfish, bearded dragon, the marsh harrier. They are lush, they are the lush of the evergreens, the cluster of daisies that sprouts from the center. They are the strength of the snail, the softness of the coyote's tongue. It's beautiful, this queer ecology, a woman said as she held my hand for the finale of sunset. Gaze at the ocean, the otters on the beach and tell me what's not to love. The beauty of being more, the beauty of being multitudes. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna have a conversation now. We're gonna have questions and answers. Uh, so uh, any of you at home want to contribute a question? Uh, go ahead and put that in the uh, chat feature, and and I'll keep an eye out for those. But I like to start off by asking poets when we have them. Uh, how you came to poetry, what your poetry uh, origin story is. Was it something um, you did all your life? Is it something that you came to? Well, I did write poems as, as a kid, as I think most kids do. And then eventually we stopped being poets and artists, um, but we all arrive in the world as poets and artists. Um, I didn't realize like being a poet was actually something you could do in real life. Um, you know, I went to public school. My poetry class was taught by an ex-DJ and we looked at Pink Floyd lyrics. So um, no idea that real, po I mean, I all the poets I'd read, T.S. Eliot, they were all dead. Um, most of them um, were men. Um, and so I really didn't have a background in poetry but I somehow made it into the University of Washington. And um, as started writing fiction. I was an English major and you can take it with a creative writing emphasis. So I started writing fiction and then I took a poetry class with Linda Beards and then everything changed. Um, then I stopped writing fiction and I started writing poetry and I didn't look back and I kind of worked to create my life around poetry. Even though I, I right after college, I thought I needed to get like a corporate job. I thought, oh, I graduated, I gotta get a real job, um, which was an absolutely not right. But that real job really taught me that I wanted to be an artist in the world. I wanted to be a poet. And from then on, I just did everything in my life so I could do that. I moved away from Seattle where it was cheaper to live. You know, I started out in a town of 3000. I think I'm in a town of 2000 now um yeah and just never looked back it was it's you know how you have things in your life that you just always they're always part of you that they've just always been a part of you they just don't go away it just never went away so wow yeah. we do have one from the audience here a process question okay uh, uh jim o'brien says i love the phrasing that i see in so many of your poems like the run-on sentence of blue jays how many of those come in revision and how many just come off the top? That's a great question. Um, sometimes I get lucky and they come off the top, but it's just because I have a really weird brain. Um, I, I'm a better writer than I am speaker or talker, communicator, um, because I don't really know my thoughts until I see them even when I'm writing them, I, I make more sense than when I'm even right now trying to explain them. Um, but I, I see things in images. So when I'm writing, um, what was the, I forget the example was the run on sentence of Blue Jays. Mm -hmm. And I love to mix things. Um, I'm constantly trying to 
um, add mixture to my poem. So if I'm writing about like being a poet and run on sentences, I wouldn't then want to add on, you know, and then we're going to add, you know, some exclamation points. I want to add something that's surprising. When I write, I constantly want to surprise myself. And so that's kind of what I do in the first draft is I just let myself write knowing no one may never see that draft. And I would say, I did a podcast today with my bad poetry. Um, and we talked and they got contacted me because I had said like 94.6% of my work isn't good. It's just boring and garbage. And I just write drafts. Um, and some of those drafts, I really work hard to revise. I definitely love the art of revision and the crafting of a poem. Um, but a lot of poems I just write to write. So I give myself the freedom when I'm writing to just, you know, to write something, which is kind of a crazy thing to say, you know, a run on sentence of of um, Blue Jays because, you know, in a certain way it doesn't make sense, but in that kind of bigger poetic way it does. So yes and no, sometimes it just comes out and a lot of it's um, revising and finding the best word and to make things the most, um, the most surprising, I think Anne Sexton said, you know, just don't be boring. And I feel like as a poet that um, I, I feel like it's a gift. You, any, every, all of you in the audience, thank you all for your notes who are here. It is a gift that you came to see me. I mean, this is your time. This is your one time on the planet and we're all here together. So I want to show up and, um, you know, let you leave with something and, and hopefully fulfill you in some way. And same thing when I'm writing my poems is I really want, um, I want the reader just just to leave with something more and 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 be entertained and engaged. I don't want to be boring. <laughs> All right. You touched on this a couple times in your reading, mm -hmm. um, but since today is Earth Day, uh, do you want to say a little bit about eco poetry and how nature figures yeah. into your work? I would love to. Um, so way back in the two thousands, I was kind of also still a Pacific, I've been a Pacific Northwest voice all of my life. I was born and raised here. And um, I remember whenever people needed a nature poet, I was kind of like who they came for because I've always used nature in my work. And at that time, calling someone a nature, you know, people, oh, it's another nature poet. It wasn't necessarily a good thing, um, but I've always been interested in, in nature and very aware of the world around me and how it's changing, um, you know, especially, you know, cougars coming out in our neighborhood recently because of the clear cutting and animals losing their homes. So I've always been writing about nature. And then I started being called an environmental poet. That word came into, um, and then I've been called an eco poet and an eco feminist. Um, but basically eco poetry is just the understanding that we are nature. So it's different than a pastoral where you know, the older poets would walk out into um, you know, nature and then write about the flowers and everything they see. No, we are nature. We are nature and we're part of the solution and part of the problem. So we are living beings, we are animals. Um, I was thinking this is an absolutely strange thing and I, I don't know why I'm gonna say this, um, but I was thinking about this in bed when I woke up this morning, I was thinking about the size of like my cat's brain. L like, and like, and I was thinking, my cat has a little brain and, and a little heart. And I started then, you know, thinking about animals smaller than my cat and thinking about, you know, their brains and hearts and that idea that we're all this, we're living things. And that's what eco poetry is and um, is writing eco poems, just the realization that we are not separate from nature. We are very much a part of it. I love that. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Looks like we've got some more questions cropping up. All right. Um, and this one, okay, this is one that touches on something we, we talked about talking about, um, the pandemic. So uh, somebody in the audience asks how it impacted your writing. And I want to add on to that. I know you released this collection during the pandemic. Yep. And how that <laughs> affected the process. So both the, your writing process and the publishing process. So um, how did the pandemic affect my writing? Uh, positively, uh, you know, I, the first part of the pandemic, I will admit that I was thrilled my calendar got cleared off and I know people wanted to see people, but I was like, oh, this is really wonderful. I don't have to go out and I don't have to go to Seattle. Um, so 
if you can see this place where I am, this is actually our, like a shed. This is a, this is our shed where our lawnmower was. Um, so everyone came home. My kid came home from college and we were all on top of each other. So I created this to write. Um, so I had a, my own space. And then I started um, collaborating with Melissa Studdard and um, NPR did this thing on us called the Queens of Quarantine um, because we would write a poem a day on a Google Doc. Um, so then that happened. So we would start one and she would write the first lines and then add, add on. And when you collaborate with someone, you have to just be okay with them just moving stuff around. Um, so we did that and um, that was something I did. And then let's see, Rhonda Broach and uh, Martha Solano and I weren't writing. So we said, well, let's, let's do a Zoom one Thursday and write, you know, just like from five to seven. And then that became like our Thursday night poetry club. So then we would Zoom and we did it every Thursday during the pandemic because there's nowhere wow. to be. And we would write for two hours. We would each show up with a prompt. Um, so I wrote a lot and I know a lot of people didn't write a lot. And I, I, I think sometimes our anxieties or our fears or, um, you know, it was a scary time. People were so afraid of their, um, anyone who was, autoimmune compromised or immune compromised or our parents. Like I was terrified that my mom was going to get it or I was going to give her COVID. Um, but I'm a poet who writes from emotion. So if I have any strong emotion, it actually spurs my work. Though um, one interesting thing, and I wanted to get the name of who asked, Mary asked this. Okay, so Mary, one thing to know though, if you read my poems, you would never know there was a pandemic. I did not mention masks. I did not mention COVID. I did not mention um, quarantine, except for when I did some with Melissa. We had a few that were really like COVID focused. Um, no, I people were at parties in my poems and people were, you know, you would have no idea that the poems I wrote were written during a pandemic because my mind wasn't there. My mind was still like free and going to parties and enjoying people and um, yeah, that's how I got through it. So the, all of those things saved me a lot. And then also I was working on my book. So I had to, you know, be a, doing a little bit revising and stuff like that. So good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, it seems like you're involved in a lot of different projects and different things, um, to Sylvia's press, uh, this, uh, initiative with the land trusts. Um, uh, one, I want to make sure we touch on the weekly muse. Mm -hmm. um, I want I, I want to know how all these different things inform your work and how you balance writing and then being out sort of as a literary citizen doing these different things. Right. Um, well, I don't believe in balance. I think I always <laughs> think that when people are striving for balance, um, you know, I, if balance is a thing, it's like chaos theory, you know, like when you um, look at something close up, it looks maybe out of balance, but if you look at it from afar, you see the patterns. So I'm very open with myself. I did for a long time, really try to have balance, like, okay, I'm going to do this on this day and really, and now I just am much more a go with the flow. If the pandemic taught me anything, it's, i I don't have a lot of control and I really don't need to. Um, and so sometimes I will like right now I'm full on into the weekly muse, which is a two Sylvia's project where we're going to send out weekly prompts. It's a subscription service and um, will help our press publish more books, but it's to help poets keep writing and, and stay to the writing practice. But we're, I'm writing prompts for that and trying to find um, ways to inspire people and support people. So, that is filling me creatively and my partner Annette to Sylvia is also in a way we didn't know. Um, so it's it's all very creative stuff I'm doing like writing the land is writing new poems, um, which is filling me. So I think my I've learned the, what I say yes to is um, does it fill me and can I control my time. 
is kind of it. So that those are the two things I say yes to. So I teach at a low res writing program. So I only have to be there for 10 days in the summer. Um, and I can do the rest anywhere. Same with two Sylvia's we learned during the pandemic, like the weekly muse we're doing from home and then we meet and we do these really major days on it. Um, so yeah, I don't really try. I don't try to balance it. I just try to follow my heart. And I always try to be a good literary citizen. I know I say yes to a lot when people ask for blurbs um, because I know that's one way I can give back. And I'm a Capricorn. So, you know, we just, we just like to fill our plates up. You know? um, we've got a question from the chat. This is a practical question. Okay. Um, do you have an agent? Mary yeah. wants to know. No. I do not have an agent. Um, Dialogues with Rising Tides was chosen from the slush pile at Copper Canyon. I submitted to their open uh, reading period. And it was, I learned afterwards that it was chosen. Uh, there was like 800 submissions that year and an intern named Britt happened to connect with my work. And she was an advocate for it and kept telling Michael Wiegers, you know, I really like this one, read this one. Um, and it was chosen. And so, no, I don't have an agent. Um, most, I don't know any poets that have like an agent to get their work published. I do know some that have um, like publicists or like Blue Flower Arts controlling their time, but um, that's not for me. And I think as a poet, if you're trying to get your work published and get a book published, find the presses you love and then submit to those presses and support them by following them on social media, seeing what they're up to, tossing them a donation every once in a while, um, liking their Facebook posts and just, you know, writing the best poems you can and submitting them is really what it is. My book is, it's luck and timing. I mean, and it, it, it's, it could have not been chosen. Um, and what's really funny is so this book was a finalist in two contests before Copper Canyon chose it. They took a long time because they had so many submissions and it was a finalist. And I lost both of those contests to a friend of mine named Molly Spencer, who the first time I won or she won, I was like, oh my God, congratulations. I'm so happy. And the second time, if I had kind of an ego, I would have been like, really, you got two books and I have nothing. But I don't believe in the scarcity mindset and I don't believe in it for poetry. And I really trust that um, we're each on our individual journeys. So I'm just like, well, maybe there's something better for me. Um, and yeah. Copper Canyon came around about five months later and I was in. And so had I been chosen by either of those two presses, I wouldn't be with Copper Canyon. So that's just kind of how the poetry world works out. <laughs> Luck and magic and, and write good poems. So that was a long answer to no, I do not have an agent. <laughs> No, that was very good. That was very good. Um, that kind of segues me into the next thing. Um, talking about this collection, I wanted to know if you have a favorite poem. I also sort of wanted to know how um, this is your fourth collection, right? Um, yes, it is my fourth collection. Okay. Yes. How, how the process of, you know, it sounds like you're writing all the time, how the process of deciding to put things together in a collection or how you put the collection together works for you? Um, that's a great question. So uh, I'm working on a collection right now. Hourglass Museum, which I think Jim said in the chat that he had read, really was like what I call kind of a project book. It was so focused on art and that. And so I was, I was actually like writing the poems that needed to be in there, which is kind of something I recommend for anyone who is doing a chat book. So my first, my very first book was a chat book and that won the floating bridge contest, but it had been kind of a finalist or rejected, rejected. And Anne Spears, I took a class with her and she said, um, ask yourself what poems you need to write. And I thought, well, that's a really interesting idea is that if we are trying to put together a collection and, and you start to see a theme, kind of ask yourself what you needed to write. Um, what was the first part you asked me about? I know you said something. A uh, favorite poem. From <laughs> oh, the my favorite, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, my favorite poem right now in the collection is Love Waltz with Fireworks because it's about falling in love with the, with the world. And um, I know that there's like this 
book does deal with like heavier topics, but I always try to have hope um, sprinkled throughout. So uh, I think that's my favorite. And right now I'm working on a new book and I have no idea where it's going. And I, so that's where I am. I have a ton of poems and I'm not really, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm being very particular with this one and I'm in no rush. I've never been somebody who wants to get a book after book after book. I'm much more interested. I'm just happy writing, honestly. So. Uh, one more thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, and this ties in with it being National Poetry Month and encouraging mm -hmm. uh, people to discover poetry. Uh, what, what poets uh, have meant a lot to you? What poets um, would you urge our audience to, uh, what other poets would you urge our audience to seek oh out? Well, if you look in the chat, there's a lot of like major poets in here. Um, you know, I saw Lauren Davis at the beginning, um, Shagaf Damala. Um, I love Ada Limone, January O'Neill. I think Cindy Beach is here. She has a great book called Her Kind. Um, Janine Hall Gailey, all of my friends. I mean, like Susan Rich, Martha Solano. So just if you know someone's my friend, you know that they've had an impact on my writing. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone that I'm really digging right now. You know, I'm kind of loving, let me pull this. This is a new Copper Canyon book, Passion uh, by June Jordan, um, that has a great uh, intro, I believe by Nick Seeley, Nicole Seeley. Nicole Seeley is an incredible, um, poet who I recommend. Yeah, you know, there's someone out there. I'm still discovering new poets. So I I could probably sit here and just keep lift, listing off um, <laughs> older poets that are in the past. Sylvia Platts has had, um, and Anne Sexton were two that have had a lot because they broke a lot of boundaries for women as ha did Sharon Olds um, and um, Louis, uh, Lucille Clifton. Yeah. So those are all yeah. great poets to check out, but, you know, scroll through, um, just scroll through the chat, you know, Mary Ellen <laughs> Talley's here, lots of people are here. Wonderful, yeah. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on, another of, of, of the things you're involved in, uh, to Sylvia's Press. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, how did that get started? And, and just what the, how the, what the evolution experience of that has been like? Um, that press was just accidentally started. Um, we were not starting a press. We wanted to publish an ebook uh, called Fire on Her Tongue. It was an anthology of women's poetry. Um, we had just gotten like Kindles and I had like an iPad and there was, there was no poetry because nobody could format it. So we started this, we made this anthology. We just invited a bunch of like women poets we love, but like now they're just, they were major then, but they're even more major. Like Patricia Smith is in it, Nin Andrews, um, Kim Adonizio, Dorian Locks, just all these people. We invited our friends to be in it. Um, but then because poetry presses are poetry presses, nobody could format it. So we we're like, well, we'll start a press uh, to publish this book. And then Marty Solano and I had been doing a book of prompts called The Daily Poet, where we just wrote prompts for each other. And then AWP came to Seattle and Annette, who is just, um, you know, just a force said, well, let's publish that. So then we had two books. And then um, Janine Hall Gailey's press, one of her press folded and we wanted to keep her book in print. So we reprinted hers and we reprinted Martha Solano's book. And then, I don't know, then all of a sudden we were printing books, we were real, but it was not planned at all. Um, and then in 2016, we got office space because we had been working from our homes. But it just shows that sometimes, you know, the universe just leads you in a way. And if if you're open to it, you know, things happen, but definitely not planned. We never said, let's start a press. We were on a ferry ride and we had had a glass of wine and we're like, let's do an anthology, <laughs> which led to, to Sylvia's press. I love that openness to experience. It sounds like it's led a lot of interesting places. Um, I, I wanted to, you, you read us some, a few of those poems from the land trust. And uh, I wanted to, you said they're gonna be recorded. And how, how will people find those? 
will those that be? I, that I don't know. It, the website is Writing the Land. If you Google Writing the Land, and if anyone is interested in, in being part of that, you can send them some poems. And um, I'm not 100% how, sure how it works, but I know that they're looking for um, new poets. And then what they do is a land will come up for adoption. And then you say like, so there was a, a beach near my house and I didn't quite understand the process. And I'm like, wait, I was supposed to like say I wanted the beach. Um, so I didn't get it. But then when I saw the Chimacum place, which is 20 minutes from me, I was like, oh, absolutely. Um, and then I'm not sure, but I'm, I think they're going to be on their website. And then I think they publish an anthology of all the poems, which is then a fundraiser for the land trusts and um, the environment. That's amazing. I really look forward to that. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. So we're getting down to the end of our hour here. Yeah. I want to I want to thank uh, Kelly again for joining us um, and and reading us all the poems. Um, I always feel a really privileged to hear the new poems and some of those things. It's that's really amazing to hear. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us so much. And thank you all at home for joining us. I should say that um, this evening is brought to you by the Longview Library Foundation. Um, and Kelly has graciously said we can uh, put record this and put this up on YouTube. So many more people will be able to tune in and, and enjoy after the fact. So thank yeah, you everybody. Thank and thank you, Kelly, again. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Longview Library and everyone who showed up. And thank you, Austin. And Shagafta put the uh, link for writing the land in the chat if anyone wants it. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Bye, everyone.